cancer in a young woman, how is it different? Because I've heard that it's more aggressive and, I mean, a young woman, first of all, would have probably much more dense tissue in mm -hmm. her breast just by virtue of the fact of being a young woman. Yep. Might even be harder to find it, I don't know. So how is it different in a young woman? So pre presenting, it's harder to detect. I mean, this, take the challenge of breast cancer during pregnancy. You know, breasts are changing and you see a lump, could be a clogged milk duct, it could be lots of things. So that's the one extreme. So it's harder to detect in a woman's breast that are cycling through menses and things like that. Most lumps are not cancer in a young woman, as we alluded to, but they should be vigilant about what's going on with those lumps and whether they're changing and whether or not it's a suspicious lump and to speak to their doctors. And then once they're detected, the cancer itself, again, is more aggressive, both tends to be more advanced because young women aren't being screened and it tends to be a more aggressive biology. So breast cancer is not one disease, as yeah. I'm sure you and most of the audience would know. And it's in buckets now, and we have four main buckets, and then there's lots of subsets. So what are the four buckets? So the four buckets are hormone-sensitive, and there's a kind of wimpier hormone-sensitive disease, and then there's a hormone-sensitive that's a more aggressive. So we bucket those into something called luminal A, which tends to be what I call grandma's breast cancer, which is lower grade, grade being a measure of aggressiveness. Uh -huh. So lower aggressiveness, very hormone sensitive, and that's one bucket. And, and treatable. And they're all treatable, yeah. they're all treatable, but that's a lower risk yeah. cancer in general in terms of its biology. Then there's this luminal B subtype, which is also hormone sensitive, but tends to be a higher grade, more aggressive cells, and higher risk and more likely to hear from it again. So it requires a more aggressive approach, still yeah. treatable. And then there's the HER2 subgroups, which is the group that has the expression of that HER2 receptor and, and the overexpression of it in, in, those, uh, in those subgroups. And that's where we have some newer targeted therapies like trastuzumab and others that's really making great headway in terms of increasing the number of people who never hear from their cancer again. Uh, but those are aggressive yeah. subtypes. The good yeah. news is that that's a big breakthrough and young women have more of HER2 positive disease than older women. They're more likely to get that. And then of course there's the triple negative which you're familiar and with. And well, because I was diagnosed with triple negative, you want to explain what it is though? Sure. And why, everybody else says, why triple negative? Sure, so it's named for the absence yeah. of receptors. So I just talked about the hormone sensitive. We know it's hormone sensitive because it has hormone receptors on it. Estrogen, estrogen and est progesterone. You got it, estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. And it, and the, hor and those, the, the luminal A1 is HER2 new negative. The luminal B1s, are hormone sensitive also, ERPR positive, that's estrogen and progesterone receptor. And sometimes the HER2 that's hormone sensitive is grouped with the luminal Bs. And the HER2 receptor, if it's positive, then you're either in a luminal B group or you're in the HER2 group, depending on how they group. There's some semantics here, and it all has to do with the genes of the tumor, which I won't get into the details of. The triple negative is named for the absence of ER, the absence of PR, and the absence of HER2 in terms of the receptors or the genes. And we have targeted therapy for all, all of those three subtypes that are the more common kinds of breast cancer, and we don't yet have targeted therapy for triple negative. That's absolutely correct, although there's a lot of studies underway. Yeah. So yeah. things so that are me. targeting receptors on the uh, triple negative. That's and, and promising? Very promising. Lots of cool research going on, looking at the specific kinds of receptors you may find on triple negative cancers in large proportions of women who have those receptors. So I'm very, very excited about kind of our new wave of studies that we will come up with some targeted therapies for the triple negative. We might have to change the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing about triple negative is it's, it's also, you know, I called it the bucket, but it's very heterogeneous, meaning there are multiple different types of triple negative. And we're just beginning to scratch the surface of understanding both the genetic aspects of those kinds of tumors and then what that means clinically. People, women hear that word heterogeneous, and it means that everything, every one of them is different yeah. and they're unlike each other, correct? It's Kinda a heterogeneous. Like <laughs> like little snowflakes, but yep. each one of them is kind of different, which means that every woman's cancer is just a little bit different. And depending on her age, like if a woman is young and she gets cancer, her hormones are different, her what metabolic rate, everything is different. So does that have to, that come into play in how you're gonna treat her? Yeah, pretty dramatically so. And, and yeah. you know, you asked about what's different for young women, and there's yeah. a different mix of disease that they're more likely to get. 
But the biggest thing that's different for young women is the hormonal milieu as well as their emotional and kind of life stage where they di are diagnosed. So hormones, young women are much more likely to be premenopausal and when they're pre as in still having periods and when they're premenopausal, they're very premenopausal. You know, they're not they weren't likely even when they get chemo, their ovaries don't get knocked out, which for older women who are still having periods, chemo can often send those ovaries into kind of a sleep where they're going to stay forever until the woman would actually have gone through menopause. And just so that we don't confuse people, though, when a young woman gets treated with chemo, it can throw her into like a perimenopause, correct? Definitely short term, even okay. for very young but women. But just so, because I, I happen yep. to just have, just have interviewed one that that, that happened to her. Um, so it can happen, but probably short term, Probably correct? short term. The younger a woman is, the less likely it is that she would stay in long term menopause. Um, or permanent menopause. But with that being said, let's talk about some of the issues that are specific to young women. Um, let's start with fertility. Uh, because the first thing that this young woman was told was to go right to a fertility specialist. She was newly married, hadn't had kids yet, wanted children. So what this, this obviously is a, a critical issue for all of these young women now being diagnosed. It's such a tremendous issue and it's music to my ears that she was sent right away to a fertility specialist yeah. because 10 years ago that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And so in the last decade or so, we have kind of pushed that agenda as a community and said, measured among young women, how important was fertility to you? And 50 some percent said it was important to me and my doctor didn't talk about it. And so now that is really changing and we're doing more and more for our younger patients and their survivorship, because fertility yeah. is like one of the ultimate survivorship. But you know, you gotta survive the cancer, but you also wanna pass those genes along. That's yeah. survival of the fittest, right? And so young women who are, you know, the, the worst is when you see a young woman who was trying to get pregnant and then she gets diagnosed because she was ready to have a baby. And now she's gotta deal with the breast cancer, the treatment, the potential threat to her fertility, as well as the waiting because we don't want people yeah. to get pregnant right away unless they had a really low risk breast cancer. And so we're actually doing research to try and figure out, can women take a break from treatment if they're on long-term treatment, the hormones, and have a baby and then get back on? We're, part one of the things we're talking about is probably like tamoxifen because that's one of the most common treatments for one of the most common breast cancers. And yet you're not supposed to get pregnant right. if you're on tamoxifen. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. that and, and let me just ask you one other thing because I kept seeing that tamoxifen should be taken for five years and I read in a blog recently they, there's this myth that there's if you make it to the five year mark you're home free and now all of a sudden they told us not so fast it's really the ten year mark so how can we clear that up for women? Sure. So with the hormone sensitive breast cancer, those buckets um, the five-year mark is, is a big mark. And I always tell my patients, every year that you're doing well is a good mark. Let's celebrate. It's good to have a party. Um, but the five-year mark is by no means a cutoff. And unfortunately, women are still at risk at 10 and 15 years, which is more rare for hearing from a breast cancer, again, particularly those hormone-sensitive breast cancers, which okay. can come back a lot later. The other buckets, they tend to come back a little earlier if they're going to come back. and so. The good news is we now have lots of hormonal therapy options that can extend the duration of therapy. So we just used to do five years of tamoxifen, then we figured out that aromatase inhibitors, another class of drugs that lowers estrogen for postmenopausal women, that can extend the amount of time that a woman can be on hormone therapy and further reduce her risk in the subsequent five years. Okay. And so then we have you know tests in young women saying, oh, the aromatase inhibitors, if you suppress ovaries, may help those young women more too. So that's, it's kind of a moving field. But the, the one that I think you may be alluding to is that we've also done 10 versus five years of tamoxifen and, and 10 years is a little bit better than five years in terms of preventing those long-term recurrences. To lower your risk to of To lower recurrence. your risk of recurrence. And that's great news in terms of it being an option. For some of my patients, both young and old, but more often the young, who were just trying to get through their five years and then move on with their lives, it feels like a jail sentence when I say to them, oh, guess what? 
you can take five more years. You know, right. they feel like they've, you know, we're about to go on parole <laughs> and get five more years of therapy. So what do you say to so, them? So I tell them that this is not a no-brainer. I say, we need to discuss that this option is here. Does it make sense for you based on your original risk of your cancer, which, which kind of portends the risk moving forward, as well as where they are in their lives? And for many women, it's not an easy answer. Yeah. They're sick of the, being on the drug. They're sick of having to take it. You know, the truth is most people tolerate it well. They just don't like the idea, especially a young person having to take a pill every day. Yeah. And of course, there are nuisance side effects, and some women are very severely affected. That Fortunately, that's rare. And so it's, a, it's an individual, tailored discussion, trying to figure out both based on, OK, what are your remaining risks from cancer over the next decade? And does it make sense for you, both medically and emotionally, and in your life, to take more therapy. And we do all kinds of creative things. Some patients will try and have a baby then and then get back on. And they can do that. They can they, take a break they and can. have the baby. And then, as I've understood it, they can start back after they finish nursing, right? Correct. And as, as you know, okay. we try not, obviously we warn people, you can get pregnant on tamoxifen if you're still premenopausal or fertile. And we don't want you to because there is a much higher risk of birth defects. But if a woman does get pregnant on tamoxifen, there's no guarantee of a birth defect. It's just higher risk. Okay. And so we need to obviously work with every individual on if she gets pregnant, you know, how high of a risk is it and and what you know, how does she feel about the pregnancy and things like that. Because we're gonna be talking with Kelly Tuthill from WCVB, a reporter there, and uh, one of your patients and I think she presented with her breast cancer at 36, which is early, and she had just had a baby. And so she, you know, she felt her lump and thought, what, probably a clogged milk duct or something turned out to be breast cancer. And she was on that, I, I guess, the first five years of tamoxifen, and lo and behold, at 44, who would have thunk it? She presents pregnant. And she was very, very concerned that I think for like nine weeks or so, she had been on that tamoxifen. But you just kind of watch the development of the baby, and everything yeah. seems to be going fine with her. And we'll talk with her actually in a yeah, little bit. Yeah, she shares all this, so I'm okay yes, with talking about yes, it. Yes, I know. Provider. That every um, second of it. Which is <laughs> yeah, when good. she blogged it, I said, "Okay, I guess I can talk about it." Yep. Yep. Um, so she, uh, you know, Kelly's amazing, and you'll you'll hear from her. But she, uh, she, you know, obviously uh, is thrilled to be pregnant. And knock yeah. on wood, so far there doesn't appear to be any problems with the fetus from what I understand. And there are risks, and there are risks potentially for the fetus, the baby, moving forward. Um, and, and unfortunately, there are reports of birth defects, so I'm sure they'll be watching her very carefully. Not yeah. her for her, but, but in general anybody, in the yeah. literature. But there have been many babies born to date who've been exposed to tamoxifen in the uterus who've been fine. fine. And so I think that was very reassuring for her to kind of get a sense of that. Again, we wouldn't recommend someone get pregnant yeah. on tamoxifen. But when it happens, and we all know things like this happen, no, no birth control yeah. is fool foolproof. Um, it's something that we just work with an individual to make sure that you know it's all okay and 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 try and respond. Well, this is this this is one of the layers of challenges that that you have to f deal with with younger women that they're starting families and they've got jobs and they're working and they're trying to stay on their jobs and kind of summon up the strength to go every day, even though they're going through chemo. But you also, I've interviewed a couple women lately that are young, 27, they're not married yet. And um, it's even the idea of telling young people, telling young friends, telling a boy that they're dating, particularly if they're serious with that they have cancer and that there's, you know, as this one young girl said to me, I mean, do I have to tell them that, I'm, that I have a higher risk of dying? So maybe am I a good candidate for marriage? I mean, I, I was really stunned when I stopped to think about the thought processes that she has to go through at just turning 27 years old. It's, it's really hard, for the, especially for the very young. You're giving me chills as we talk about it. I know. It, it's so hard, especially for the very young or for people who aren't in established relationships. Um, and who want a relationship. Yeah. Uh, it, it can be very, very hard. And obviously, every woman's going to decide how she's going to deal with it. And I counsel my patients. We get people help, uh, you know, get them on uh, people to help them both emotionally and from a peer support standpoint. How did you manage this? Uh, because it's such a challenge. And, you know, most people want to be able to talk about what they went through. And I always tell my patients, look, the guy's not worth it if he can't you know, have this conversation. At the same time, it may not be the per thing that the person puts out there on the first date. And I, I think the more important thing is the internal feeling. One of yeah. the things I face with my patients is, 
but especially the very young ones come in and they feel like damaged goods. And you see this in many cultures. There are certain cultures where women are truly not marriageable if they're, they've gone through treatment or there's a strong family history. Um, I've dealt with patients through other colleagues in the Middle East where you know the, wow. the marriageability of a family can decrease with an illness in the family, and of course breast cancer is one people fear, and, and so it is a really serious problem, particularly in some cultures, and it's certainly an emotional problem for women even in our culture, which is pretty open and free and people accept a lot more. Um, and, and so uh, it, it is a real challenge. I always recommend to people to get some extra help emotionally. I think of it yeah. as going to the gym. You know, mm. if you had a hip surgery, you'd go to the rehab, right? And yeah. you'd do all these exercises. Yeah. I always tell people, if you've been through a breast cancer, Let's get you some extra support. Will you be okay in the long run? Sure, you'll probably be fine. But don't you want to get there faster and better? And so getting a little extra help emotionally, especially for our younger patients who can be really scarred both internally and out outside. However, the most of the experience. support groups that are out there have been kind of designed over the years for the older women. Yeah. So this is a little challenging. I've literally been asked in, by half a dozen women in the last few weeks, what about us? What about us 20-year-olds in their early 30s? Where's our support groups. Yeah, and there are, the good news is there is a complete Starting. movement working on that. So we've, we've developed through our Young Women's Breast Cancer Program a telephone support group for the young women because they're too busy to come in and they need to you know, be home. They may have young kids, they, they're going to work during the day, when are you gonna have that support group? And that's so, for anyone, any woman for anyone, around yeah. the country going through yeah, it? Yeah, it's usually for people that are at our institution, but there are other, uh, other foundations and groups that do this. So that living beyond breast cancer, uh, which is an advocacy group who has a whole young women's program as well, and we partner with them. Coleman has young women initiatives. Yeah. Um, there are many other groups. There's one called the Young Survival Coalition, which is based in New York, and they have a lot of activities and, and online interactive things, because the young population also is perfectly happy to be online and connect oh, with people yeah. and be blogging and, and to be you know having chat rooms and things like that. So there's a lot of initiatives, and, and the CDC is sponsoring these young survivor um, initiatives, and they're paying like lots of good grants to centers around the country, including our center, for all of us to be developing programming to enhance the support and education of our young patients and their loved ones. So people should be excited about this if they're living with this and or have friends who are, and let them know about that. And, and they can go online and see it on the CDC website, what is CDC doing for young women? Mm -hmm.